Fools say in their hearts that there is no God. Fools say in their heart that I'm capable of whatever I put my mind to. Fools say in their hearts that I don't have to rely on anybody else's help. Fools say in their hearts that my ego cannot be broken. Fools say in their heart that there is no God. Would you do me a favor and take somebody by the hand all over the building? Let's touch and agree as we look to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we rejoice today because we recognize that you are the source of all of our blessings. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. God, this morning we simply greet you by thanking you for the gift of this day. For we recognize that this day is a gift that we didn't deserve or earn, but it's because of your grace and your love that we've been able to come into this sanctuary and worship you in spirit and in truth. God, thank you for being God. Thank you for watching over us this week. Thank you for keeping us, protecting us, covering us with your love and with your grace. God, I don't just thank you for my own life today, but I thank you for the miracle that I hold on my left and on my right. God, I squeeze my neighbor's hand this morning to simply remind them that when other people are jealous of their life, I celebrate their life. God, I squeeze my neighbor's hand right now to remind them that when other people are judging and criticizing their life, God, I affirm their potential and I believe in what they're about to do. God, I squeeze my neighbor's hand to remind them that no matter what looms over next week, oh God, they can do all things through Christ who gives them strength. God, right now, we ask that you would send a word that will make us better. Send a word that will equip us for the week ahead. Send a word, O oh God, that will empower your saints and allow us to know and to hold on and to see what the end is going to be. God, we love you right now. We simply ask that your Holy Spirit would flow through this place. And as you move in this place, O oh God, we'll be careful to give your name all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise in Jesus' name. Come on, loose those hands, put yours together, and make a joyful noise to the Lord. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we've come to rejoice and to be glad in it. Indeed, won't you help me celebrate the amazing gift of our pastor? Come on, even in his absence, can't we thank God for the amazing life, ministry, and gift of the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley? Indeed, to him, to all of the clergy who labor alongside of him and to the leadership of this house, I am always humbled and grateful to stand behind this sacred and historic desk. I am especially grateful as this weekend is a time of reflection for me. And tomorrow I will celebrate seven years in the gospel ministry and I am grateful that as a young man, this house was able to affirm my calling that God had placed on my life. I recognize that there are many historic churches who do not license teenagers or women, but I am grateful to be in a place where we recognize when God's gift is operating and even in those that other people may not affirm, and I celebrate the amazing gift of the Alfred Street Baptist Church. If you're hungry for a word, I ask that you would grab your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm number 14. Psalm number 14. Many of you know that we are wrapping up our series all throughout the month of July. We've been preaching from the book of Psalms. And I pray that as we journey to Psalm 14 today, we find one more insight from these beautiful words of poetry. Psalm 14, when you found that, if you would please stand to reverence the reading of God's word. There's a rather peculiar word that I've been wrestling with, and I pray that while it may be difficult to swallow, I pray that it may have an impact in a positive way on your life. Psalm 14, beginning at verse 1, you find David say words similar to these. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise, any who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good, no, not one. 
Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. Look at verse number one. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. Amen. As you take your seats this morning, I want you to pray with me as I speak from the subject, notes from a recovering fool. N notes from a recovering fool. Beloved, I'm not as wise as I would like to be, but I'm proud to say I'm not as foolish as I used to be. Maturity has been a slow journey for me, but I like to believe that I'm progressing day by day. In fact, earlier this week, I bumped into an old friend who I hadn't seen since high school, and when we saw each other for the first time in years, we immediately began to reminisce on one fateful Friday night from our high school years. I'll, I'll never forget this night when the gym at our high school was packed as we cheered on our basketball team in the regional playoffs. My school was no good at basketball, but we were having one of those Cinderella story years. And early in the second half of this game, I began to get a series of text messages from my father. He tells me that the snow is coming down really hard outside, and out of concern for his teenage son, who just began to drive a few weeks ago, he advises me to hurry up and come home. But 16-year-old me says, Dad, it's a tie game in the third quarter, and I can handle driving home in a little bit of snow. He proceeds to then remind me that I've never driven in snow before and that it would be wise for me to come home right now. Well, fast forward through the night and a series of continued text messages, I ignore everything that's going on in my phone and I refuse to acknowledge the reality of the blizzard taking place outside of the building. We win the game, that's the good news, and the crowd is full of enthusiasm until we walk outside and we see all of our cars and the roads covered in snow and in ice. Well, after some moments of scraping and getting the car out of the snow, me and my friends pack in my old Toyota Corolla and we make it about halfway home before two cars spin out in front of me and crash into each other, blocking the road in front of me. And now I'm stuck because there's an accident blocking the path ahead of me and there's a steep hill covered in ice that's keeping me from backing up and going the other way. My friends and I look at each other and we realize this is not going to end well for us or any of our parents. About an hour later, my dad shows up to the rescue and when I saw his face and I thought about all those text messages he had sent, he didn't have to say what we were both thinking at the time. This boy is a fool. <laughs> Church, all of us, if we can be honest, we can think back to moments in life where we deliberately played the fool. Somebody gave you good advice and you chose not to listen. You let misplaced priorities trick you into making a dumb decision. You convinced yourself that you could handle a challenge that you had not prepared or practiced for. Fools think that they can handle anything because they think that nothing is greater than them. But the wise get to a point in life where they recognize that I don't always know what's best, I, that I need to rely on the advice of others, and that there are some obstacles that I'm not ready to conquer yet. There are some things that are greater than me. And this morning, we journey to the 14th Psalm, and we hear a harsh yet helpful reminder that all of us have been fools at some point in our lives. David says that all of humankind has gone astray, that there is no one who does good. He emphasizes it, no, not one. All of us have been in places where we denied the reality of God, when we tried to rely on our own strength and lift ourselves up to unhealthy heights. David says that fools say in their hearts, that there is no God. Fools say in their heart that I'm capable of whatever I put my mind to. Fools say in their hearts that I don't have to rely on anybody else's help. Fools say in their hearts that my ego cannot be broken. Fools say in their heart that there is no God. And I know, I know somebody this morning is saying, preacher, I'm a good Christian. I've never said that God doesn't exist. And maybe you haven't denied God's existence with your mouth but you have denied God's existence with your heart. 
David tells us how we deny God with our actions in this corrective psalm. He shows us what types of foolish characteristics we exercise. And in describing our foolishness, he also paints a path towards wisdom. As a recovering fool who's still in progress, I want to highlight a few lessons from this psalm that I believe can help us all grow into who God is calling us to be. This psalm shows us three things that fools do that we would be wise not to do. And church, I believe that if we can avoid these three mistakes, our lives can be happier and healthier, and we'll be able to proudly declare that I'm a recovering fool. The first is simple. We are foolish and we say there is no God whenever we try to make idols our substitute God. Look at the first three verses. David says that fools are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. He says that God looks down from heaven to see if anybody is wise and God can't find anyone who is seeking God. You know what you're doing when you're not seeking God? You're seeking something else that has become your replacement God. Because we always spend our time and our energy chasing after the things that we earnestly desire. And God says, when you're no longer chasing me and pursuing me and seeking me, I know that you filled your heart with other desires and priorities and you put your relationship with me on the back burner. I came to ask somebody this morning, what have you been seeking lately? What idols have been capturing your time and your attention? Who's the person that you put all of your hope and all your trust in? What are some of the habits that you let creep back into your life since we stopped fasting in January? What are the idols that we use to replace God? Idols are so dangerous because they tempt us to rely on possibilities that don't have a guaranteed future. Money will disappear, celebrities will lose their appeal, relationships will break up and come to an end, but there is a God who is more consistent and reliable than anything else we can put our hope in. Let me pause right here and talk to all of the heartbroken folks in the building. I know that that loss devastated you. I know the separation crushed your spirit because when relationships fail, we not only have to wrestle with our own disappointments, we have to deal with the fact that others around us now see us as a failure. And now you're not only heartbroken, but you've also lost your confidence and self-esteem because the image of the future you were building has now been defeated. But I came to declare that when all of this passes away, There is a God that you can put your trust in, and there is a God that you can trust with your future. You've got to decide that I'm tired of seeking things that won't last. I'm tired of letting people make a fool out of me. These idols can't give me the certainty and assurance I need, so I'm going to turn to the solid rock. And if nobody else approves of it, if nobody else celebrates it, I know that God is looking down from heaven and is going to be pleased with me. I refuse to be the fool who is celebrating We're chasing a substitute God. I wonder if there's anybody in the building who can testify that I'm chasing God and God alone. I've tried every alternative. I've tried to live life on my own, but I've discovered that I need God like chicken needs hot sauce. I need God in my life. And I'm determined that I'm not going to let any idol interrupt my prayer life. I'm not going to let my career path get in the way of my devotional time. I'm not going to let any brunch plans force me to miss church. I can't get no help in here. I'm not going to let busyness keep me from reading my Bible. I'm determined to make God a priority, and there is no idol that will keep me from seeking God's presence. God's been too faithful to me. God's been too kind to me. God's forgiven me too many times for me to act like I've got more important things to chase after. I will not exalt a substitute. I will prioritize the God of my salvation. Fools say in their heart that there is no God. We say there's no God whenever we make idols our substitute God. And catch the second one, it's closely related. We say there is no God whenever we abuse the children of God. It's a timeless truth. The pursuit of material riches will often cause us to mistreat and abuse any person who stands in the way of the possessions that we desire. The pursuit of personal happiness often coincides with the abuse of others' humanity. Notice what David says in verse number four. 
The evildoers eat up my people as they eat up bread. Because fools don't recognize God, they likewise fail to value the children of God. When you don't know God, it's easy to disrespect God's children. When you don't know God, it's easy to separate families and lock God's children in cages. When, when you don't know God, it's easy to not fix gun laws or the water system in Flint. When, when you don't know God, it's easy to dehumanize an entire city using imagery of infestation and rats. Because the fools that don't know God lack any motivation to respect God's children. Forgive me, forgive me. I didn't come today to talk about your president. I, I, I've lived long enough to know that all of us have placed greedy desires above healthy relationships. We've all at some point or another sacrificed a relationship on the altar of selfishness. Greed has a way of infecting our minds and corroding our hearts. And if you want to mature from a place of foolishness to a place of wisdom, you've got to start prioritizing people over possessions. Nothing you buy, nothing you wear, nothing you hold or drive or live in is worth more than the people that God has providentially connected you with. The great tragedy of our society is that we love things and we use people. People were meant to be loved, things were meant to be used, but we have reversed the order. And now because we're so obsessed with money and the material, we will abuse and neglect and disrespect any person who stands in the way of a possession we desire. But I wish I had some saints in the building who can say I'm determined to give others the respect that I desire for myself. I choose to give you the grace and the dignity that you deserve. I choose to listen to you and not speak over you. I choose to get a deeper understanding about you rather than assuming the stereotypes people speak about you. I choose to respect our diversity rather than demonize our differences. I'm going to break the cycle of disrespect because I'm determined to be bigger than what was done to me. I will respect every child of God that I cross paths with. David is a prime example of what it means to be a complicated human being. Here in Psalm 14, we can sympathize with his lament and complaints about those who disrespect and devour people. And yet we also know that David has his own extensive track record of abuse and harm. David had a father who neglected him and a predecessor who terrorized him. And in similar patterns of dysfunction, David neglected his own children and took advantage of and abused the woman he was connected with in relationship. He even went as far as to murder the husband of a woman he impregnated. And the Psalms sit in this complicated tension of a man who is both victim and perpetrator of abuse. It reminds all of us that we have a responsibility to break the cycle. Yes, they hurt you, but that does not give you permission to hurt others. And we as complicated human beings must always be aware of the ways in which we replicate the hurt we experienced. I've got to be able to see the abuse, experience the abuse, be raised in an environment of abuse, but not recycle the abuse. I'm determined to give better than what I received. I'm determined to be healthier than the habitat I grew up in. I'm determined to rise above the pain of my childhood. I wish I had two or three witnesses in the building who can testify that you are determined to break the cycle. I will be better than what was done to me. I will not replicate my parents' shortcomings or my friends' insecurities. The devil will not have a generational victory in my house. I bind the cycles of depression and addiction and molestation and domestic violence. You are not bound to the pain of your past. Whom the sun sets free is truly free indeed. And because I'm free, I can imagine a world where abuse isn't recycled. You've got to get to a point where you say the abuse around me has pained me so deeply that I refuse to add to it. I refuse to give life and energy to it. From this day forward, I will use all the strength I have to create a better world than the one I was born into. We are foolish when we make idols our substitute gods. 
We're foolish when we abuse the children of God. And then finally, we are foolish whenever we fail to recognize the expansive nature of the love of God. When in verse 5, David says, God is with the company of the righteous, it seems like a statement with little significance. But this statement holds a great deal of power. Because throughout the course of history and throughout our own lives, all of us have attempted to define who is and is not included in the company of the righteous. One of the dangers of our faith is that as we strive to live into all that God is calling us to be, we can be tempted to label others around us as righteous and unrighteous. And one of the most foolish things you can do is attempt to decide who is and isn't on God's team. Fools fail to recognize how expansive the love of God actually is. God's love is always larger and wider and greater than you think it is. And the body of Christ is constantly crippled by Christians who want to play gatekeepers for the company of the righteous. You know some gatekeepers. You know how they talk. Well, she must not really know God if she comes to church dressed in outfits like that. He must not really know God because he can't ever seem to find or keep a job. Maybe their family is going through all of that because they don't have any prayer life or anointing in that house. We love to decide and label who is and isn't in the company of the righteous. And the worst part is we use Scripture to restrict God's love rather than expand God's love. Alpha Treat, I've got a feeling that God is tired of us manipulating this book to cause pain for the people that we were supposed to be ministering to. Stop using God's book to neglect God's love. I just got a few folks. Somebody's not with me. You're asking, Elijah, where does it say that in Psalm 14? Well, I'm glad you asked because this final lesson doesn't come directly from David's words, but it comes directly from David's life. Every now and then you have to step beyond the Psalter and examine the psychology of the person who gave us the poems. The Psalms are illuminated when we examine the context that created David's fears and his confidence and his hope. Can I take some time to teach this? We'll shout at 9.30. I, I, I just want to teach this because we find an interesting note about the context of David's life in the closing chapters of the book of Ruth. In those final verses of Ruth chapter 4, we are reminded of a genealogy that connects Ruth and David. Ruth and her husband Boaz had a son named Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse, and Jesse had a son named David, which means that Ruth is David's great-grandmother. And what makes this so interesting is that Ruth is not a Hebrew. She is a Moabite. David's great-grandmother comes from the country of Moab, that seems insignificant, Denzel, until you turn to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy provides us with some of the laws of the Hebrew people, and there in the very law that governs David's kingdom, we find these words at Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 3. No Ammonite or Moabite shall be admitted to the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants shall be admitted to the house of God. Don't miss this. David is four generations removed from his Moabite great-grandmother. The Moabites were a hated enemy of the Israelites. And even though God's law would restrict David's family for six more generations, God's love still chooses to reach down and anoint David as king. Oh, God, I feel the Holy Ghost coming. God's love shows someone who wasn't qualified, wasn't acceptable, wasn't even lawful because sometimes God's love has to break God's law and save our lives so that we can recognize how powerful God really is. David's life is a testimony to the extraordinary power of God's love. If David had never experienced the law-breaking love of God, we would have never had any of these psalms. And we are foolish every time we try to limit and manipulate and restrict God's love and refuse to give it to people we don't get along with. Guess what? You don't like them, but God still loves them. You, 
criticize them, but God still believes in their potential. You want to keep them out, but God is still inviting them in. You waste your time gossiping about them, but God is still going to be good to them. You say that they shouldn't have the right to get married or preach or make the same amount of money as you because of their gender or sexuality, but God is still opening doors for them. You lie about them and try to tarnish their reputation, but God's favor is still on their life. You say they shout too much in church, but that shout is just a testimony of how the love of God lifted them back up after everyone else tried to knock them down. I wonder if there's anybody in the building today who can testify that God's love lifted me. I had a whole lot of fools try to keep me down and put me in my place, but God's love lifted me. I didn't deserve it, surely couldn't earn it, but God's love still lifted me. I was broken and bruised, but God's love healed my heart. I was lonely and abandoned, but God's love filled the empty spaces. I was anxious and fearful, but God's love gave me peace peace everlasting and now I can look back over my life and celebrate that love had the power to lift me when others tried to throw me away when nothing else could help love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me if that's your testimony you ought to lift your hands open up your mouth and praise God like you know your laws and your rules, your hate and your gossip couldn't keep me down because God's love stepped in to redefine my life and his love made a way where there was no way. Love has the power to lift us up again. If you're not standing, stand with us. There is somebody today who needs to know the power of that love. What they said about you, what they did to you does not have the power to define your life. The words they spoke over your beginning will not consume the future God has for you. God says, here's how powerful my love is. It will break the laws and the restrictions that others use to keep you out and invite you in. So my sister, my brother, this is our time of invitation. We say to you that God is waiting with arms wide open. All you have to do is take a step into this aisle, walk down and meet us at this altar, and we'll introduce you to a God whose love knows no boundaries, whose love knows no limits. God loves you wherever you are.